please welcome the president and CEO of Jordan Advertising and chair for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, Rhonda Hooper. I wasn't asking for applause, I was applauding y'all. <laughs> that really looked weird, didn't it? Well, good morning, thank you all for being here. Welcome to the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber's eighth annual State of the Economy. And first of all, I would like to recognize and thank our today's signature sponsor, and that's Arvest Bank. Let's have a round of applause. For eight years, the Chamber's State of the Economy has been a key way for our Chamber members to basically access information and intelligence about the economy. And I think we can all agree that information about economic trends is really critical to help guide our city's continued progress, as well as for to help guide you as you think about your companies and organizations. And guess what? That future really looks bright as we approach 2019. And amazingly, unemployment is at an all-time low, and em employment is at a 10-year high. Wow, we needed applause for that. I tell you, the theme for 2018 has really been about job gains. Through September, the Oklahoma City Metro added nearly 16,000 jobs over the same time last year. And year-to-year -year employment gains are now approaching 2.5%. Yes, we've already exceeded this year's originally forecasted 1.4%, which was 9,100 jobs. We exceeded it by 7,000 jobs. That's incredible. You can, I tell you, you can learn more about what's going on in these gains and how they're positively impacting our economy when we release the 2019 economic forecast in early February. We're hopeful to see the job gains continue in, well into the next year, but let me talk about this year. Job growth has been buoyed by new entries to the market from companies like Kratos, Amazon, and Rural Sourcing but also in addition to existing companies hiring more workers, as well as contributing robust capital investments and infrastructure across our city. Additionally, the almost billion dollars of new capital projects in downtown alone will only further strengthen our city's highly successful visitor and tourism industry. And just the same, developers across the city are making their marks from Gary Brooks uh, innovation with the first National Center downtown to the Medallion Group's creation of a premier leisure and entertainment destination in Northwest Oklahoma City at Chisholm Creek. These are just a few examples of the many remarkable projects that are creating jobs, adding to our economy, and bolstering our quality of life. So when you're driving around town, I encourage you to look at all the dozens of cranes dotting the city that is, if you're not dodging orange construction cones. In fact, we wanted to make that obvious, so all the construction cones on your way on 63rd. But you know what? All those things are signs of progress, and they are temporary obstructions, but long-term gains. It's a true sign, and I'm encouraged by the growth that we continue to see throughout the city. Now, today's panel of experts and our dynamic keynote speaker who I just met, and he's um, <laughs> be prepared for the year ahead, and we're going to have some good discussion. And I definitely am encouraged by our panelists because they are rock stars. We have a dynamic trio, and we'll have a brief Q&A period after our panel of discussions. I have five questions I'm going to pose, and then we'll turn it over to them um, for y'all to ask questions. And um, before I introduce them, I, I, I want to say this, and I think it's been um, announced, but on Monday, we went to Washington, D.C., and Oklahoma City was recognized as one of the most livable communities in the entire nation. Us and Boise, that's a round of applause. All right, you ready for the dynamic trio? You better not let us down, Dynamic Trio. Their full bios are in your program, so if you will, please come up when I introduce you. Our first panelist is Dr. Robert Doffenbach, 
the Senior Associate Dean for Economic Development and Impact and Director of the Center of Economic and Management Research at the Price College of Business at the University of Oklahoma. Round of applause for Dr. Doppenbach. Dr. Russell Evans is the Associate Professor for Economics and the Executive Director of the Stephen C. Agee Economic Research and Policy Institute at the Minder School of Business at Oklahoma City University. Round of applause for Dr. Evans. <laughs> and our final panelist is Mark Sneed, an economist and president of Region Track an Oklahoma City-based economic research firm specializing in regional economic forecasting and analysis. All right, ready to rumble? <laughs> okay. I can hear the clinkings of those salads, and don't take away our salads, okay? <laughs> My favorite part of these meals. <laughs> All right. I have five questions I want to pose, and, um, and then we'll have a couple that are kind of a free-for-all, if you will. So the first one is regarding the Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma, and then the Oklahoma City metro economy. In looking at the state and Oklahoma City metro economies, what are the areas that concern you the most? And on the flip side, where are you most encouraged? So Bob, you're sitting right next to me. How about you being the first one up? All right, thank you, and thanks again every, every year. I, I'm glad you continue this tradition of handing out the questions ahead of time so we have an opportunity to prepare. <laughs> I, I, see, I see a great need to pay uh, more attention to diversifying our economic base, and I, I say that from the standpoint that uh, we, have a, we have a great lead uh, uh, base in, in our energy sector in Oklahoma, but we also have a great deal of volatility of our economy associated to the ups and downs uh, of that cycle. And right now, uh, of course, we've gone from uh, from uh, a fairly a very low uh, price in 2016 in the in the upper 20s uh, to a high of 75, and then recently we're seeing this collapse. Now, uh, some research I've done shows that we're looking at an 80 percent correlation between the share of energy earnings total energy earnings in, in Oklahoma, uh, an 80% correlation, uh, and, and that rate has gone from a low of 5% share of total earnings when oil prices were low to a high of 20% when oil prices are high. We're now at the 10% uh, uh, level. So I see a great need to pay more attention to uh, diversifying our economic base. We've got a great uh, uh, lead. Uh, uh, area and defense and aerospace. Uh, we've had some recent uh, wins in, in that sector. Uh, weather and radar, uh, transportation, warehousing, uh, data services, light manufacturing, healthcare. Uh, these are all areas that, that uh, I, I think are, are, uh, are certainly germane for, uh, uh, for continuing our uh, diversification efforts. Thank you, Bob. Mark? Well, I, you asked about concerns first. It, I, can I, can I flip yeah. your question a little of bit? Of course you're going to change the rules. Um, <laughs> you know, Bob talked about some, some of the long-run philosophical issues we're taking, but I'll, I'll share with you some of our uh, more shorter-term uh, outlook and observations for what's happening. And, you know, we've had two, literally two full years of recovery at this point. It has been a strong recovery. I don't want to overstate that. It, it has been a nice, strong bounce back. Not, um, you know, there have been occasions in the past where we've seen a, a much larger bounce in conditions, but two years, very solid growth. We're, we're in a catch-up phase at this point. We, we still have a little bit of a performance gap relative to the U.S. after two years, literally two straight years of job losses. So we're in catch-up mode. We've recovered maybe two-thirds of that, of that loss at this point, so we've made quite a bit of progress. Um, strength across the board. There are a couple of industries where we aren't performing quite so well. Um, I, would, I would throw out the newspaper sector, the, uh, the information sector, the financial services sector showing a little bit of softness. But when you look across the board, though, uh, we're firing on nearly all cylinders. Uh, tax revenue has bounced back nicely. Our, our best guess is that for calendar year 18, 
we're probably going to see about 10 percent something in double digits low double digit tax revenue growth income has bounced back nicely so uh, we're we're pleased in that in that energy driven cycle that bob's describing we're pleased that we've recovered i, I would categorize this probably two-thirds of, of what we lost in the period so good, uh, good. concerns I, I really have two the the u.s slowdown maybe creeps a little closer to us and um, the second is oil prices continue to drop um, I, they're, they're somewhat related I think if oil prices continue to drop it reduces the likelihood that that US recession backs up on top of us but uh, it would also increase the likelihood that maybe our growth rate slows substantially so those would be my two two concerns at this point makes sense thank you mark Russell yeah, so I, I, building on a lot of what's already been said, I think um, uh, on the optimistic side, what has me encouraged is the, is the rapidly improving uh, livability of Oklahoma City that you, that you mentioned as you, as you opened the remarks, Rhonda, is really, I, I think about successful economic development as being successful economic activity followed by a signal to the outside world of the economic success that you're having. And Oklahoma City has certainly enjoyed over the last you know, 10, 12, 15 years or more uh, a run of some pretty impressive economic success. And we think about things like the Oklahoma City Thunder as sending a signal to the outside world of the economic success that we're having. And, and so I'm excited, I'm optimistic about things like the developments happening down at the, the, the river complex, uh, having the streetcar come online. I'm excited by a uh, convention center and a downtown park and a convention center hotel. All these things are signals of economic successes uh, and that, that further enhance and attract that livability. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I would echo uh, and add my concern to Mark's concern. My concern would really be what's happening outside of Oklahoma City and what's beyond our control, and that is that U.S. economic conditions are going to likely slow in 2019 relative to what we just experienced in 2018, um, and it's more likely that there is uh, forthcoming downward pressure rather than upward pressure on oil prices. And so if you, if you extend that into 2019 a little bit, my area of concern would be outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, some some economic weakness and Oklahoma City being in a position as Mark just just described where we're not fully recovered from 2014 2015 or 2015 2016 and so we really don't have the cushion to absorb that weakness should it develop um, so that would be my area of concern makes sense well next question is relative to education and workforce and Mark if you would feel this first um, one of the most disrupted industries in the world right now is education. There are more third-party organizations that are created that are offering uh, courses, credentials, and certifications than ever before. Traditional college intuition, or intuition, traditional <laughs> college, maybe that was intuitive, <laughs> traditional college tuition has been increasing. So, and in Oklahoma, we've seen several for-profit as well as private colleges close their doors. What is the future of our education system and what impact will that have on employers and the workforce of tomorrow? Wow, that is a, that is a big, big question. question. Let me, I'll, I'll try and narrow it down to the way we, we are mostly looking at the, the world in education. You know, I, you would think this would be preaching to the choir that everyone would be aggressively trying to improve education at every level and we, you know, funding would be coming, forthcoming rather easily but it's not, it's not really preaching to the choir. It really is almost missionary work that, that you have to often go to hostile territory and you have, you know, often your message is not well received or it's not understood about education. So we, we, we still have, I think, um, some, some cultural issues in Oklahoma and I think we have uh, some missionary work to do to, uh, to, you know, to make these things happen. But um, what I would suggest to you is that that chaos you described in education delivery, that's really, a, for most economists, that's a fabulous sign. The blood and guts on the operating room table, that means that you know, progress is being made. We're, we're, we're being innovative, we're trying new things. Firms are, are succeeding, firms are failing. Private, you mentioned public and private sector entities. So, so that is just the, uh, the creation and destruction process in education. I'll make one observation on that, and that is that I think that is mostly confined to higher ed at this point, mm -hmm. and we haven't really seen anything but the leading edge of it in common education. So I think we'll, we'll, your, your question will probably be a lot different in five years. It will probably focus more on these, these chaotic changes in delivery and method in, in common ed. 
But we're more concerned about that core question of are there still returns? Are there still income gains in education? Is there, has there something changed? There's a, there's a common refrain that we're producing too many college graduates that's used quite often. And what I would tell you is that when we look at the data and we turn it upside down on its head and try and determine you know, if there's any sort of meaningful change in the returns to education, we find that there, there really is almost no discernible shift in the payoffs to education. You see, you see these huge premiums to, to anything above high school completion. You see huge discounts in, in, in income earnings for those who don't complete high school. Um, what, what I think is being translated as too many college graduates is the fact that these premiums, which are really large, have, have declined a little bit in the past decade. So I'll give you some magnitudes to think about. Instead of a bachelor's degree producing, say, 125% premium to a high school completer, now maybe it's 118%. And in our world, that's not evidence of too many high school completers. In fact, what we really are, are, are thinking is that in the data, it really is more of a reflection of the performance of high school graduates doing relatively better than college, not, not shrinking the other way. It's not that the gap is shrinking down, but the gap is actually shrinking upward. And so when we see the data, the gains are not only strong across the U.S., they're even stronger in Oklahoma. If you take every level of educational attainment over the past decade, and if you adjust them for cost of living, we have made income gains relative to the U.S. in every single education category. I think the catch there, though, is that the strongest gains are at the lowest education levels, which is a great thing. The, the weakest gains have been at the highest levels of education. And, and you may think that is, that's a negative, but the reality is that the gains we've made over the past decade in closing that gap have shifted from something like, just for magnitudes here, a college degree to a uh, worker in Oklahoma would earn something equivalent to 88 or 89 percent of the U.S. level a decade ago, now is more like 97 percent. So despite there's a gap, the gap is closing very quickly, and for us, um, we don't see too many college graduates. We don't see meaningful or, or significant downward pressure on the returns to education. They're still there, and um, it you know, at some point, yes, you will hit that. You will hit that point where there could conceivably be that, that problem of way overproduction, way too much supply of college graduates. But I, I don't think we are, we're, we're within shouting distance of that at this point. Got it. Yeah. Russell or Bob? Go ahead, Russell. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I just, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> just just, just, in, just in, in support of what Mark has said, I'll just repeat a statistic that I, I mentioned last year, and that's since 1992, uh, more than a quarter of a century ago, there has been no growth in employment of those who have high school degrees uh, or less, high school diplomas or less. Uh, the 34 million gain in employment has been very concentrated uh, in uh, at, at least some college associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, bachelor's degrees and higher account for 85% of that 34 million gain in employment. So there's, there's a tremendous uh, surge in educational content of employment in this, in this country, and I don't see it changing. I, I guess the only thing I would add is, is, and just follow up on Mark's comment that that at some point we're gonna have to really think about common education and how do we use technology, how do we use those things that are disrupting and innovative in higher education that are disruptive and innovative in commerce and industry, and how do we disrupt and innovate in common education to really achieve uh, higher educational outcomes there, and that area is not, is not particularly disrupted yet, but I think that's coming, hopefully it's coming. Disruption is the way of the world now, so be ahead of the game versus behind it. Yeah. All right, the third question is federal economic policy. Bob, this is yours. <laughs> so no bo nobody is pointing fingers at you. Early next month, Jerome Powell will be celebrating his one-year anniversary as the chairman of the Federal Reserve. It has been a lot more exciting than a lot of people thought it was going to be. And in fact, a lot of people think maybe there's a little too aggressive uh, stance in terms of its interest rate hikes. 
What are your thoughts and where do you think we're headed? Well, it's never a good sign when you appear in Trump's uh, tweets and, and he uh, asked Mr. Sessions, uh, he's not very happy with you and he's certainly uh, not been happy with the uh, interest rate increases that uh, the Fed has been, uh, has been doing. Uh, but I, I, don't think, I don't think there's any choice that the Fed has but to be more vigilant uh, on uh, the inflation front. Uh, certainly, we don't uh, have unanchored inflation, not any indication that it's getting out of control, but we definitely have a hot labor market in the United States with a 3.7% uh, unemployment rate with jobs growing at a, at a quarter million uh, pace uh, month after month. Uh, so uh, we are looking at, uh, at, at certainly a national economy that's, uh, that's incredibly vibrant and we expect to at least continue with a lot of, uh, of the growth that we've experienced. Uh, at the same time, we've got uh, fiscal policy, which has gone a little nuts this last year uh, uh, with, uh, with tax uh, uh, decreases, both corporate and personal. And uh, certainly we've got uh, uh, situations developing uh, in the high dollar uh, value of the dollar, and that's affecting uh, trade and prices of energy and, uh, and such. But the, but the point being, the Fed had taken its balance sheet from 900 billion in 2008 to 4.5 trillion. It bought up all of these, all of these, these assets to reduce the supply of assets on the market, raise the price, and lower interest rates. And now, maybe this uh, this expansion we have seen is getting a little long in tooth, and we have to be a little more concerned about building up uh, a war chest to fight uh, the next recession should it come about. And I think that's what, what, the, what the Fed is doing. Now, they've been also decreasing their holdings by $50 billion a month. That's $300 billion uh, a year. Uh, uh, so what you're seeing in that is on top of an $800 billion federal deficit, we've got considerable paper hitting, hitting the private markets, uh, pushing, uh, pushing up, uh, uh, up supply, lowering price, and thereby increasing interest rates. So we can, I think, continue to expect interest rate uh, pressures. That's going to kind of affect the housing market. Uh, we're certainly seeing nationally and internationally slowness developing on the world economy. Uh, we're seeing uh, certainly instances uh, where instead of uh, this, this very vibrant, synchronized international growth, uh, we now have tariffs and uh, trade wars and proxy wars and a lot of uh, unsettled uh, uh, conditions on, on, the, on the world economy that's affecting global growth. Uh, point being, the Fed, I think, will be data-driven. If there's softness developing, I think they'll respond to it. And as a consequence, uh, uh, maybe they'll have an excuse not to be so vigilant on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, contractionary front. And we don't have QE, any, QE anymore, quantitative easing. We have QT. And uh, my suspicion is that uh, uh, actually the slowness we're seeing on the international front will actually uh, yield a uh, relaxation in the pace of pursuit of quantitative tightening uh, by the Fed. I was wondering what QT stood for, yep. quantitative tightening. Yeah. Cool. That's not on the QT. <laughs> <laughs> Mark or Russell, can you top that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll add a couple of things. You know, one of the last things Bob said was the, F the Fed is very data-driven, and they are remarkably data-driven. And what I would suggest that you can interpret that is that they are far less concerned about causing a recession than you and I are or the president is. They're far less concerned about that. If, if their objective is to slow growth, they will slow growth. You know, we, we look at the post-war period really carefully in cycles now trying to get a better feel for, for why they end and what, you know, what is it that jumps on the back of that recession or, or the expansion that finally pushes it into recession. And, you know, the, the Fed has pushed rates up 11 times aggressively in the post-war period. 
and nine times we had immediately it was followed by a recession. So they have a fabulous track record of using interest rates to slow growth. It's worked nine out of 11 times. In fact, it's, it's worked 11 out of 11 times, and two of those times they just relaxed rates and, and, and re, uh, growth actually slowed substantially, but didn't turn negative. So 11 out of 11 times they have succeeded in meaningfully slowing growth, nine of those immediate, you know, preceding a, a recession. So I am under no illusion that they are not working towards slowing growth. They will slow growth. I'm guessing by the end of 2019, we'll probably have a much better feel for it than we have here at the 20, 2018 period. Our U.S. employment forecasts have trailed off a bit from 1.7, 1.8, where job growth is right now. We are thinking 2019 now is probably going to transition closer down to 1.5% to growth. And we think 2020, you know, conceivably could could be significantly slower. Recession, I don't, I don't, I don't know at this point. There's no clear evidence. If oil prices uh, fall further, significantly further, I'd say it's again less likely. Nearly every one of these recessions uh, were accompanied by both Fed tightening and rapidly rising energy prices. So, if we have one of the two, I would say it will definitely affect growth. Um, if we have a sharp drop in oil prices, it may extend this six more months, but I, I think the, the Fed has declared their position. They're very data-driven. They will continue to gradually raise rates. Bob has said he thinks that they probably will marginally ease off, I, th I think it's fair to describe it, that they will probably marginally ease off maybe from their, their current position. And I would tend to agree with him for one reason, and that's because I believe the philosophical um, focus of the Fed on price stability and maximum sustainable employment it's, it's tilting just a little bit. It, 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 there truly are changes within the Federal Reserve System with, with a more s uh, social conscience. I mean, it, there, are, there are concerns about extending this, this expansion as long as possible, assuming it doesn't, in some sense, conflict with those policy objectives. But, but nonetheless, I, I think they probably will show some easing in, in uh, their policy tilt as well. Okay. I expect that. Yeah, so I think, first of all, we should all take a moment and, uh, and just recognize that in the seven or eight years we've been doing this, this, that is the most deferential Bob has ever been towards the Federal Reserve System. So I think, <laughs> so, so, I think there's some real growth there, Guilty, Bob. Pretty, guilty. <laughs> pretty impressed there. We finally got a hawk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a, an adorable uh, nine-year-old daughter. Um, just love her tremendously. She's just terrifically sweet to her dad. But she's also terrifically clumsy. Uh, she is so clumsy that when she was just a few years younger, we actually took her in for a neurological consult to see if there was like a neurological <laughs> reason that she kept falling down. And, uh, and the neurologist, after examining our daughter, his diagnosis was that uh, your daughter's not the most coordinated child in the world. That was the official <laughs> diagnosis. So my nine-year-old daughter, this is the metaphor I use for the Federal Reserve right now, is my nine-year-old daughter is, is, you know, will be running. And if you've ever seen like a, a child running faster than their legs can carry them, or the child gets running down the hill, and you can see that the child's about to fall, right? You can see that the center of gravity has gotten in front of their legs, and you know it's about to happen. And my daughter will be in this position regularly, and I find that I'm in the position, here being the Federal Reserve, trying to slow things down, in the position of trying to reach out and sort of grab her and, and let her ease into a soft landing, right? Let her <laughs> ease into, just slow her down back to a pace that, that she can sustain. Uh, and as Mark alluded to, the Federal Reserve is, is uh, terrifically effective at slowing the economy down when it wants to slow the economy down. I think uh, the, uh, the reality is they are often like I am in that when they try to slow their daughter down, I do more damage than good, right? I create the fall, right? So as I try to ease her into a slower pace, what usually happens is that I jolt her or I jostle her or we crash together. Or, and so I think there is some concern here. I think the, you just think about it, the question was, where is policy going? Um, I, I think the expectations are for a, a December rate hike and probably three more short uh, rate hikes in, in 2019, maybe four, but I think three is probably a good, good place to set your baseline. Um, I think they will be successful in slowing economic activity, as Mark alluded to. They have a history of success there. I think the concern is that, uh, is that they, are, they, they would be slowing economic activity into a cycle where some natural slowing taking place through uh, tariff concerns, through geopolitical uncertainty, through, as Bob described, the unwinding of this coordinated global growth. And so for me, there is some concern here that, 
that as we try to slow the economy down into something that's sort of sustainable and, and ongoing, that we overstep a little bit and we jostle things, we jostle things uh, a bit, and that could be the thing that, that significantly slows uh, economic growth. I, the only thing I would add to that, if you're, if you're following the Federal Reserve, I think, uh, um, um, I think maybe, uh, you know, Mark was, was not strong enough in, in, in talking about how the Federal Reserve priorities are starting to shift a little bit, that social awareness that we used to think about a Federal Reserve as being objective 1A was price stability and then everything else fell below that. But increasingly, you're, you're seeing a Federal Reserve that's willing to, to think about full employment and some other social considerations and give them a little more weight and risk maybe a little bit of higher inflation or risk some of that price stability. You're seeing them elevate priorities like financial system stability or and so I think that there's, I think that's an interesting perspective to watch, particularly as we have a president who uh, is about to have four or five governors now out of the seven member board. And, and I don't know that we know what the president's monetary philosophy is. And I don't know what, I feel like we have a, a Federal Reserve board right now that I'm not sure that I know clearly what the philosophy of the, of the group is. And so I think it's a very interesting dynamic to watch here as we go forward. Okay. I want to cover two more questions before we run out of time. Energy. Oil and gas production in Oklahoma is at a record high, but with fewer rigs and fewer workers, as in years past. Is this a trend that we should expect to continue, and how do we anticipate our state's oil and gas economy to perform next year? Who wants to be for Bob? Okay, I'll start. Uh, in 2008, we were producing 5 million barrels of oil per day in the, the U.S. Uh, today we're approaching 12 million, 11.7. We're up 2.1 million barrels just in this last year. And that's with the Permian bottled up. They can't get oil out of there, they have to truck it out of there. The pipeline infrastructure, it doesn't really exist yet and it won't be really in place until late 2019 where we really start flowing. Net crude imports have fallen from 12 million barrels per day in 2007 to only 1.8 million barrels per day today. And that's, that's crude, that's not all refined product. On a refined product basis, we're net exporters of total oil. And so we're looking at a very dramatic, dramatically changed situation uh, in terms of uh, the productivity side of it we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2008, uh, we had 14,000 fewer workers employed in oil and gas extract extraction than we have today. So with all that increase, you know, it, it, productivity has gone, gone just bananas. Just uh, incredible how much productivity uh, has increased. And I'm not, not sure that, uh, that uh, we're seeing the end of that uh, either. So yes, uh, we've had, had tremendous gains. Uh, in terms of where things are going, well, I'll always, uh, I always uh, fall back on my, uh, my fail-safe, uh, uh, time-tested uh, 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 forecasting methodology that uh, uh, when times are bad, say that they'll get better. Uh, when times are, are good, say they're likely to continue at, at about this pace. When times are really great, say, well, you know, we're probably not going to be doing as well uh, in the future. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but I am I am shocked at the at the drubbing uh, that that uh, uh, the West Texas Intermediate Crude has taken in the last uh, few days. We've fallen by 26 percent inside of a month to, from the 76 dollar uh, high we've seen recently, and I, I think we were like like 55, and this morning is 56.56. I remember seeing as I, as I left the house. Well, why the fall? Why the fall? Well, I think I think a, a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, first off, last year, as we were talking about earlier, we had coordinated, synchronized, uh, uh, international growth. We had uh, great uh, prospects for continuing less developed countries, continuing to uh, to grow. And let's face it, that's where a lot of energy demand, new energy demand, will come from from less less developed countries. What do we ha What do we have today? Well, we have uh, trade wars, tariffs, uh, Chinese economy is uh, faltering, uh, evidence uh, seems to indicate. 
uh, we're not uh, looking at, at all at, at, at a vibrant uh, future of coordinated international growth that we were seeing earlier. Uh, the sanctions against Iran have, uh, have appeared to be kind of toothless. Oh, you can have another six months, you know, to, to adjust your oil sources. Uh, and uh, that's when, when that came out, uh, uh, West Texas Intermediate started falling off the cliff. So I still think that we're looking at, uh, at an industry that, that's uh, going to uh, be very good for, the, for Oklahoma in the long run. But right now, it's incredible what, uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, for example, many of the uh, ETFs of oil service companies, uh, stock prices on these ETFs are lower now than they were when oil was $27 a barrel. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, as they say, uh, the, the, the stock market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. <laughs> and, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly, that's certainly uh, the stock market is always right even when it's very wrong. Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to see how it all plays out. But we're there's there's some strange signals developing here, uh, strange signals in the way that you know I'm looking at uh, three dollar and seventy cent corn, uh, five dollar wheat, uh, uh, copper at two dollars and seventy cents. Uh, there's 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 things that look a little strange and deflationary, frankly, uh, that I haven't quite uh, made full sense of. So very interesting times. We'll see where we, uh, where we are in, uh, next year. The one bright spot we have is uh, $4 December uh, natural gas futures. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and I think natural gas holds a, a lot of promise for us uh, in, in the future. Uh, certainly experiences its difficulties. And certainly, uh, when we're all driving these electric vehicles, they're going to have to make that electricity from something. Exactly. Thank you, Bob. Anybody? <coughs> Yeah, I, I'll offer a, a couple. Um, I had a, I had a different answer for you two weeks ago yeah. than, than I have today. Exactly. You know, and in fact, um, I think our forecast numbers are probably going to look a little different at the at the beginning of the year. If um, there there is no magic number for oil price, when do they start, you know, contracting? But I think there are some ranges. And going back and looking at these last two cycles, it looks pretty clear to us that. When prices drop below 60 into the 50 to, to high 50 range, the industry clearly makes adjustments, both drilling activity and employment-wise. And when the numbers get close to 52, 50, high 40s, they aggressively make these adjustments. So we're, we're in the middle of those. We're, we're past the point where I think they're already making adjustments, even though if you, if you listen to these earnings calls over the past few weeks, the, the uh, adjustments have actually been slightly expanding drilling activity. But I, I think they're already making some, some minor adjustments, and we're looking for that low 50s range. If it does, it's probably going to pull our job numbers down from, you know, something like 1.7% for 2019, closer to 1.2%. 1, 1 it would make a major difference in our outlook for the state. All right. Yeah, so a, a year ago, our forecast, when we would look at oil prices, our forecasts were built around oil prices that ended 2018, ended this year um, in the upper 50s, and so not far from where. So I'm going to ignore the fact that it ran off to 75 and back to 56. I'm just going to call it a forecast win, right, that we <laughs> sort of ended up where we said we would end up. I'm going to ignore everything else that happened. Um, but I, to me, this, this drop in oil prices feels a little bit forward-looking, right? So this feels a little concerning to me. Um, and, that it, and that it looks like that, there's, that this is oil prices, is there a drop in oil prices that is looking forward and anticipating weaker economic conditions. And so that's, I think that, as we alluded to at the beginning, to me that's the overriding concern is that it, it feels like this is a forward-looking uh, proactive drop rather than a responsive drop to, weak, to already weakening economic conditions. That has me concerned a little bit as we go into 20, uh, 2019 um, and 2020. And then to Mark's point, a lot of uh, the activity that we see in the state is a reflection both of existing prices and expectations of future prices. And so if you see prices come down to the mid-50s or that low-50 range that Mark was just talking about, but producers believe that there is downward pressure that will move into, that low, into the 40s or in that, some of those thresholds that Mark just described, I think there's a, there's a concern there that you could see a, a rapid, uh, an aggressive reduction in activity in the oil sector, in the energy sector. Okay. Uh, just a f quick footnote there. I would say that uh, we're looking at a lot of uh, cost reductions that have occurred 
and I'm not sure that the uh, uh, that the uh, oil industry in Oklahoma was looking for prices to be a whole lot much better than fifty dollars. That's right. So I think uh, I think that we're uh, in a position where uh, our companies can make good. That's not mean doesn't mean they're going to be hiring massive more and whatnot, but it, it does mean that uh, we'll have uh, have pretty good uh, prospects for turning profitability and paying down debt as we go forward. All right. My last formal question I'd like to ask is on the state's fiscal policy. Nine days, ago, nine days ago, we elected a new governor and voted on five state questions. There were a lot of ideas during the campaign on how to address our state's fiscal challenges. Uh, do you agree with any of those ideas? And what are some practical measures that might really make a difference? Russell, would you start this? Yes, yeah, so in the interest of time, I'll go fast and, and, and then let the comments you know, take over, but um, I did appreciate that uh, Governor Lex did on the campaign trail regularly talked about trying to take a $20 billion perspective and not the six and a half, seven $7 billion perspective of the appropriations, but to take a broader, more holistic view of, of the, the size of the public sector. I'd like to see that conversation broadened to include the nine or $10 billion worth of tax credits, exemptions, deductions, and really think about the public sector, the state's public sector in its $30 billion entirety and step back and have a, a broader conversation about what do we want to accomplish through the public sector, what are those mission critical functions we see as a state, and then what's the system that best delivers on those, those mission critical objectives. And so I like the broader perspective, but I think it can be a little broader still. Um, I like the idea of state question 800, but I, I, di I didn't like the, the, the specifics uh, that were proposed there, but I, I do like the idea of, of avoiding these situations. Bob opened up the talking about volatility of avoiding a situation where we take these periods of, of oil booms or mini booms and we have these tax dollars that are coming in that we are spending as though they are a recurring dollar, but they're not a recurring dollar. They're a one-time dollar associated with this boom in economic activity. And the state has a habit of taking these dollars and spending them to, committing them to a recurring expense. And so I appropriate them to an agency or to an expense and then comes back the next year and, and wants that appropriation plus 3% and the three, it's not there anymore, right? Because it was never a recurring dollar to spend with. It's, it's a bit like getting that bonus at the end of the year and then taking it and using the entirety of the bonus to build a pool in your backyard, only to realize that you also have to buy, you also have to like pay for the maintenance of the pool, right? You've committed yourself to a recurring expense, but you don't have the recurring cash flow to manage that, that recurring expense. So I like the, I like the spirit of that question, but I didn't like the, the specifics of that question. And then I still think as a state, we, we, the reality is we are an energy state. Um, totally agree and applaud, you know, Bob's comments, talking about the, 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 the need or the benefits from diversifying the economy, but the reality is, at least for the next generation or two, we will remain, we will remain identified as an oil and gas as an energy state. We will remain characterized by volatile energy, uh, business cycles. Um, and so we, we have to find a process that better manages the reality of the cycles that, that we're going to be faced with. Gotcha. Okay. Amen, Brother Russell. And broadening the budget. <laughs> yeah. yeah, broadening the budget, broadening what we define as the budget. Yeah, yeah that is a, that's a critical point. Um, I'll, I'll, add, uh, I'll expand on the stabilization question, but there's, I think there's an underlying factor with the state budget that isn't particularly well understood, and that is that there's a, there's a structural difference in the growth rate of the economy and of total tax revenue. We, we have, you know, we've tinkered with the tax code in a variety of ways the past 15, 20 years. And at this point, we have, we have economic activity growing at a slightly faster pace. And that there are probably some growth effects we've enjoyed over the past two decades because of that. But it, I think we've, we've sort of collectively realized we've probably hit the limit of that, that we're probably going to have to somewhat raise the growth rate of tax revenue, um, even if it is slower than the rate of economic activity. And I, I think that's the, that kernel of truth that's underlying some of this budget issue. But um, to follow up on the stabilization point, this recession in 15 and 16 gave us the most marvelous real-time experiment we could have ever hoped for. A, a, a oil and gas recession in an economy that was performing extremely well the U.S. economy was performing extremely well. Ne nearly every sector of the state was doing well. We experienced a collapse in oil prices. We had a two-year, uh, just steady as can be, recession at the state level. 
Oil prices resumed growth, the industry resumed growth, the state resumed growth, and it gave us a perfect experiment to determine how sensitive the state really is to oil and gas activity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely as classic an experiment as we could have drawn up ourselves. And here I think is the key, that from peak to trough, tax revenue in the state fell by about 15%. But that really isn't the net decline in revenue, because two years later, revenues should have increased, based on our forecast and based on budgets and planning, another 10% over that two-year period of recession. The real sort of dynamic net decline in tax revenue, it wasn't 15%, it was 25%. So I think what we've learned in terms of stabilization is that the oil and gas industry is still of a magnitude enough that it can generate a net 25% decline in tax revenue from a without a national recession. With actually a strong national backdrop, the industry alone can create a 25% drop in tax revenue. That begs more aggressive and way more than the, you know, you, you said you were not satisfied with the initiative, I would, I would go even further that we, we aren't even close to nibbling at an effective solution to stabilizing a 25% drop. There's a long way to go. All right. Bob, can you sum it up in 10 seconds or less? You're, you've been the man of the zingers today, so. <laughs> well, I, I would just say, uh, just, just add to that, uh, certainly we're volatile, uh, but there, was, there were rate changes too. And part of our comeback was a rate change in the severance tax, in the cigarette tax, along with a recovery that brought our revenues back. We were at, uh, we were at uh, $8.6 billion on, uh, on, a, on an average uh, annual basis. Uh, I look at these things, I correct it for inflation, I smooth it out, I do seasonal adjustment. Uh, we went to 10.3. From our low point, we went up by 20% from that base. Uh, we were at 9.9 .9 with high energy prices in, in the third quarter of 2014. Point being, we had had almost this 20% drop that you're talking about, and then we popped back up. We popped back up as a result of recovery of the energy industry, but also higher severance taxes and cigarette taxes that brought us up. Uh, I think I agree with you certainly that we face r risks on that front with, the, with what we're seeing now. Do we have, we have one minute or two minutes for one, does anybody in the audience have a burning question you'd like to ask? And if so, raise your hand and then a, a member of the staff will come over. I guess they addressed it all, huh? <laughs> I take, did they, uh, right, where? Please stand if you will, you're, you're so tiny. <laughs> here, here you go, here's your mic. Okay. Uh, Hi, everyone. I'm a assistant professor at the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, since the tax revenue and the Oklahoma economy is so sensitive to oil industry or the price of oil, then the uh, state government is thinking about, of course, diversification of the development of the economy. Then I'd like to know that the state government, how do they allocate the resources, for example, the tax revenues, the increase of the tax revenues that benefited from the oil boom and allocate this budget to the uh, other industries to, you know, to contribute, contribute to the uh, diversification. I mean, uh, the details maybe if, thank you. Anyone? I'll let Russell take that one. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think if I understood the question right, the question was essentially um, how does the state use the tax revenues to try to di diversify the economy, right? So, and so I, I think we see what, I think what, what I generally see in the economic development world is that uh, the paradigm is that economic development happens best when you create the, the conditions that foster economic activity rather than a heavy handed determination of trying to create the next industry, right? So instead of saying, we want to be known as this state and we're going to work to bring in this industry to become the state. It's about creating the livability, it's about creating those conditions, it's about creating an educated workforce, it's about doing those things that then invite the, nat the organic economic development. So the diversification happens uh, uh, naturally. 
I think we have some diversification happening inside the state. We've looked even inside the oil and gas companies. I think we've talked about this before. The occupations are more diversified than they used to be. So even within an oil and gas company, the skill sets are a little more transferable. Um, a generation ago, you were either employable, uh, you're a geologist was either looking for oil or teaching a high school science class. Those are kind of the two options. But I think now inside the oil and gas industries, there's, there's data science, there's, there's all sorts of skills in, in those industries that are transferable. So there's a little hidden uh, diversification happening there. Um, other than that, I think we're really just trying to create the conditions and, and waiting to see what that uh, what diversification brings. All right. Well, I tell you what, did we promise a dynamic trio? Brilliant and fun to listen to, and the man of the zingers. And, I, and is your daughter's name Grace? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Please enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back shortly to resume. Look at our sponsors. Still enjoying your lunch, and please, please continue. Didn't I tell you those were the best salads in Oklahoma City? You have to mix up the Green Goddess dressing. Before I bring up our keynote speaker, though, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our local and state elected officials who are able to join us today. And if you would, would you please stand and let us recognize and say thank you? Randy, halfway. <laughs> Butch. George, how'd you get on the back row? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for being here today and for all your hard work that you do for us every day. I'm pleased to introduce a firehouse. I can tell you that. His name is Peter Raschuti. He's a top-ranked professor at Tulane University's Freeman School of Business. He's a graduate of Babson College and started his career at the investment firm of Kidder, Peabody & Company. He later served as the Assistant State Treasurer for Louisiana, where he successfully managed the state's $3 billion investment portfolio. In 1993, he founded Tulane's nationally acclaimed Birkin Road Reports Student Stock Research Program. And today, that program leads 200 business students in search of overlooked and underpriced stocks in six southern states. He and the program have been featured widely in the financial press, including the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and the New York Times. In 2014, the Financial Times published his first book, Stocks Under Rocks, which I love that name, that is such a clever name, Stocks Under Rocks, and he currently hosts a popular weekly business program called Out to Lunch on National Public Radio in New Orleans. Is that the right pronounce? Okay, I'm from Louisiana, but I'm from Shreveport, so I was a Yankee. Okay, <laughs> you have to learn how to talk Southern Louisiana. Okay, he served as a director of Emeticis Inc., the nation's largest home health care company from 1997 to 2015. Please help me welcome, he is, uh, he is so charismatic, Peter Raschuti. Great to be here. You know, I've taught at Tulane now for 32 years. So, uh, you know, I've been there so long that undergraduates are coming up to me and saying, uh, you know, my mother had you, you know, and uh, I'm like, what are we talking about here, you know? And um, they, uh, oh, man, it is, uh, and it's great to be, I teach college kids for a living, so it's just great to be with adults. It really is. You, you look good. You look terrific. And they, uh, and uh, it's funny, I've you know, we're about my age, you know, we're, the, we're at that stage of life where the term pulling an all-nighter pretty much means sleeping through the evening without having to get up to pee. So, um, so we're, you're my people. This is going to work out. This is going to, they, uh, <laughs> actually, I'm looking forward to moving to, you know, retiring and moving to one of those retirement communities in Florida. You ever been to these places? The, uh, the male-female ratio is awesome. It's like, man. If you can, if you can drive at night, you're George Clooney, you know. And these, uh, so it's um, this is gonna really work out. Let's see where we are in here. Let's see. These do seem to be my slides. Um, let's see. Don't take any of this too seriously. Uh, I want to give you a little confidence in me. This was a stock picking contest where I went against arguably the top financial mind in this country, Mike Ditka, and uh, I, I was. Uh, I was the investment instructor for the New Orleans Saints players for a number of years. And if you want to see people confused about their money, the NFL players really are a good example. They, uh, is, uh, they're just like you and me. They're, 
they're nothing like you and me. They're really wealthy and really young and gigantic. And uh, and uh, now I was I was there before the Drew Brees years, so they were not very good those times. So I used to I can't use the joke anymore. I used to use which is you know if the, uh, why don't the Saints have a website? And that's because they've never been able to put together three W's. So that was um that was um that was uh the. Uh, <laughs> I've had a big quarterback day. I saw Terry Bradshaw at the hotel you guys put me up at today, and I saw Archie Manning last night in the New Orleans airport. And, uh, and thank you. I'm, I'm at that old Grand Dame Hotel, the Hilton downtown. It's just, just beautiful. The amenities are so nice. The, uh, the, uh, the towels are so fluffy I could, I could barely shut my suitcase. So it's, um, it's really, uh, really working out here. Let's, let's see. The... Um, People are very confused about money and the economy. They really are. They, a recent poll, they asked people what the Federal Reserve was. A quarter of them thought it was a brand of whiskey. Um, 30% an Indian reservation, 45% of wildlife refugees. This is not good. This is, uh, um, we talk about the Federal Reserve. Uh, I know, you know, I have former students at the Fed. I have friends at the Fed. They are smarter than me. They are better dressed. They have less body fat. Uh, these are... <laughs> These are smart people, and we should let them run the organization. I'm very, very concerned about the idea that politicians would now have input in the Federal Reserve. I mean, you have these press conferences like, oh, it has recently come to my attention that now some of our imports come from other countries. Ah! This, uh, we can't do this. No, I really can't. So uh, let's see. The, uh, oh. Oil thoughts. Uh, Louisiana's a large oil and gas producer, as is Oklahoma, so I thought we'd uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, you know, basically what we had in uh, October 1st of 2014 is Saudi Arabia wanted to hold on to its market share, and they basically wanted to crush the American oil industry, and they sort of did. Uh, in Louisiana, for instance, the, the Gulf of Mexico has almost no activity right now, but the one thing they didn't factor into was the, pr was the r really kind of the amazing portion that shale has been able to produce. It has been a production miracle, a game changer that's made the country energy independent. One of the things you need to know and when you're thinking about shale, though, there are the other side. Uh, uh, you have the situation where a lot, of, a lot of these companies don't make any money. They're producing a lot of oil, but they're not really profitable. A lot of them are very highly leveraged, um, and uh, basically as interest rates come up, this is could be a very difficult scenario. So, uh, in fact, one of the things Wall Street has been asking now is that executive pay be tied to profitability, earnings, and free cash flow, and not to just production. So, you can kind of see we're hitting a point in there. Oil price pressures, and this is all beyond the last couple of weeks or whatever, short term, uh, with the abundant shale production, which is, you know, you guys in, in Texas and uh, and being able to produce so much oil and gas that it's sort of when oil prices go up, the shale production goes up and pushes the price back down. Long term, I think the real issue is alternative fuels. Now, I know a lot of people think alternative fuels are just like some hippies in California, and they're not. It's a real big deal. It's, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you want to know how far it's come along, uh, the big three automakers in, in uh, Germany, which would be uh, Volkswagen, BMW and uh, Mercedes-Benz have announced that their intention is by 2030 to no longer make an internal combustion engine. That's how fast it's coming. And it's a big, big deal. So we'll have to see where this goes. It's very important because 70% of oil is used for transportation. So we have some real issues uh, looking forward uh, on, that, on, the oil, uh, on the oil front. Uh, the other thing, of course, you have to remember is there's about a half dozen states like us that really benefit from higher oil prices, but the rest of them uh, benefit from lower oil prices. Uh, those lower prices, the pump, have been saving consumers billions of dollars. Uh, it's been good news for retailers, uh, U.S. manufacturers, and other businesses such as the airlines. Retailers have done well because you know what they say, I read this in The Economist magazine, is that, uh, where's it uh, oh yeah, the less cash you put in the tank, the more junk in the trunk. That's um, they uh, that no, actually got that from a rap song. Actually, now that I think about it, but still, good idea. And um, and the airlines, you know, fuel is their greatest their greatest cost, and they've been making a fortune, which is amazing because the airlines haven't made money since Kitty Hawk, you know. And uh, it is just incredible. Uh, uh, of course, every seat is full. Every seat when you go into a flight. I, I was in the jetway in Dallas about a year ago, and there was a guy with me, and he smelled of alcohol, and he's telling me how he's never been on a plane. And I thought to myself, damn, snakes have been on a plane, you know? And, um, and 
And if you're on the plane, who's on the bus? That's what I want to know. So they, um, we'll have to see how all that, uh, that goes. The, um, and some airlines, and uh, this is just, I think, just gouging, is some airlines are now charging for emotional baggage, which I think is wrong, <laughs> very wrong. They, fear of commitment, $125. So there's, um, they, uh, the one... The one I like, though, was I read this in the New York Times a couple of years ago, is German Chancellor Merkel, who's like the hardest working woman in the world. She's trying to fix Brexit and save Greece and now save Italy. Um, so she's flying around Europe, back and forth, back and forth. So she has to fly into Orly Airport in France, which some of you, in Paris, which some of you have uh, maybe flown into. And she has to go through kind of a minimum customs, uh, just like the rest of us. So she goes through customs and the French custom officer says, uh, uh, just two questions. Uh, nationality and she says German and he goes oh, occupation and she goes oh no we'll just be here a couple of days so it's kind of a kind of a Nazi joke really and um yeah you don't get a lot of new Nazi jokes the uh, the, uh, <laughs> the other the other thing that happened is of course these lower oil prices are uh, really have kind of defanged our enemies. Like the people who really hate us, like Venezuela and Russia and Iran, you know, are total oil economies. So, uh, you know, they're really by hurt by these, by these lower prices. Um, this is uh, done by Wood McKenzie, which is a company that follows the oil field. And this is what they see about electric cars. They see it moving up gradually uh, each, each year. What we think is when we get, we're around, we're around the 1% mark here, when it gets to about two, two and a half percent, is when the change is gonna occur. And you know the way capitalism works. Capitalism works so that you're gonna go to bed on Tuesday night and, wait, and there'll be no, filling, no fueling stations for electric cars and you wake up Wednesday morning and they're gonna be on every single corner. That's kind of what, what happens if you look at it. And of course, democracy and capitalism are the only, only systems that work. I think the, in addition to shale, the other big energy story is happening at the bottom of my state in Louisiana, almost towards the Texas border around Lake Charles. This is the, LNG facilities are being built there, and it's the largest private investment in the history of the country. $50 billion has been invested in this project, and it's pretty amazing. What they're doing is we have so much natural gas. I mean, we really do, you know, it's a lot of it, we're not even looking for natural gas, we're looking for oil, and the gas just comes up as a byproduct. But uh, we have so much natural gas that prices around $3.50 a thousand cubic feet and such. What they're doing is they're taking that natural gas, bringing it to Lake Charles, they're freezing it, way beyond freezing it. They're dropping it to 265 degrees below zero. And then, um, then they take, when, by doing that, they shrink the size of the natural gas into one six hundredth of its size and load it on these ships. And the reason they do it is arbitrage. Uh, we can get gas here for about 350. It goes for six dollars in Europe and about 10 or 11 dollars in Asia. And that's what's going on. It is about the most fascinating thing I've ever, uh, I've really ever seen. I've had a couple of tours over there, and uh, very, very interesting. Um, if you look at, there is a big distinction between electricity. Um, electricity is generated by natural gas, coal, solar, and wind. Uh, natural gas is now the largest producer of uh, electricity in power plants. Every new plant built in the last 10 years, and every one on the drawing board going forward is natural gas. It has surpassed coal. And, um, and planes, trains, and automobiles are run nearly entirely uh, on oil. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, well, now, uh, you look at worldwide where they think it's going to go. Basically, the percentage of uh, electricity being generated by coal will drop quite a bit. Nuclear will go down. Renewables will go up. And natural gas go up. Natural gas is going to be the big winner. And, that, and it's great for Louisiana. It's great for Oklahoma. Um, the, it's kind of interesting. Now, coal, um, only the administration is pushing coal. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, natural gas is cheaper and it's cleaner, which eventually logic will win out. So I think it's good for both of our states. I, it's part of the administration's new uh, Black Lungs Matter initiative. And um, they um, don't know really what that is. <laughs> you can see that now we're at the point where even coal doesn't believe in coal. This is the Kentucky Coal Museum. It's, it's really powered by solar. I think <laughs> it's kind of over. It really, it really is. And good for our two states. So. Uh, um, one thing is the problems all over the world, no question about that, but what you need to know is these problems all over the world have actually been a positive for the U.S. financial markets because we're viewed as a safe haven. So you've got 
Putin and the Ukraine and, and, uh, and Syria, that's not good. You've got the Chinese economy very tied to these tariffs and slowing down. China's a huge market. You know, China has a billion people. You know what a billion people means? A billion people means that if even somebody tells you you're a one in a million kind of guy, there's a thousand other people just like you. So that's a, that's a big number. So, um, and then of course the problems in the Mideast, you know, but we've been fighting over there for 2,000 years. But I always run into people that say like, ISIS, let's bomb them back to the Stone Age. I always think, yeah, what's that gonna set them back? A couple of weeks? You know, it's um, the, uh, that might not be the right answer. So we will uh, see. Uh, and remember, sex is the leading cause of people. It really is something. Just wanted to, just wanted to get that out there right now. They, um, let's see. There's a lot of spin going on in politics. There's always been a lot of spin in politics, but spin economically is very dangerous because you're making decisions based on what you hear. Like one of the things you hear is we don't manufacture much in this country anymore. And the truth is we manufacture more than we've ever manufactured in the U.S., but we're doing it with far fewer workers. And about 87% of those job losses are due to efficiency, automation, robotics. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I, I'm always in industrial plants, so I do kind of see this. I was, I was thinking to myself, though, when I was making this slide, is that uh, several years ago, my sons are now at both at Tulane, but one was um, eight and one was 11, and, uh, and, and we went to the, the new Coca-Cola bottling plant in New Orleans. It was very high-tech. I wanted to see it all. And so it about the size of two football fields, and they had like six employees, you know? And, I'm, and I remember the manager talking to my sons at the end. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know what I like about robots? They don't fight with their wives. He goes, uh, they don't come in hungover. And uh, my sons are like, stranger danger, stranger danger, you know? So as I... <laughs> What has happened? So, um, oh, God. And you talk about the financial news. I mean, Jesus, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. You know, you listen to, like, uh, CNBC, which is my station. You know, it's like, ah, uh, the Chinese are buying our debt. It's going to be wicked bad. Dogs and cats living together. You know, um, they, uh, <laughs> and then I'm watching Wolf Blitzer on the Situation Room, and he starts talking about the economy, and now even I'm getting scared, you know. And I think to myself, damn, if my name was Wolf, I would not grow a beard. That would be the first thing I wouldn't, I wouldn't do. So, um, <laughs> there's, uh, there we go. There's a, yeah, then the other, but once I was in London giving a speech a couple of years ago, and I, I was getting ready in my hotel room, and they had this financial station on, their financial station. They had a, a woman anchor, and she says, uh, now this stock has fallen over 60% today, and uh, that's not good, is it? I thought, yes, that's the way we ought to take bad financial news. Well, live a lot longer. Let's see. Um, woo. Okay. Uh, unemployment is at a 50-year low. If you're unemployed now, it is a function of either a skill or a geographic mismatch. The so skill, we have a lot of people that are trained for jobs that just either don't exist or aren't going to exist. It's going to take a lot of corporate money, a lot of government money to get people uh, skilled for what's needed. And geographic mismatches still hurt the market. A lot of us have moved in our careers. It's going to have to happen. People are going to have to, to move at it's, it's some point in some of these areas. Um, this, is a, this is the labor force participation rate. Like sometimes you hear unemployment's a 3.7%, but you know, it's much bigger if you look at labor force participation rate. And it's around 63% of the labor force is working. And you hear this number and you get all rattled like, you know, we're the only ones working and such. But this number includes anybody over 16 years old that is, uh, all, it includes anyone who's going to school, uh, at home raising a family, disabled, the retired. You know, I was going to name this slide, uh, get up, Grandpa. You know, it's, um, they, <laughs> it is, uh, I've already worked. And um, so it is, uh, this, this number is only going to get worse as the baby boomers like me retire. So it's, uh, it's not a really good index to look at. Uh, you can see the new jobs, basically, since this economy turned around. It's been averaging right, you know, around 200,000 new jobs that, since uh, about 2009 every month. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, and you can see the jobs that we are have, you see, is kind of very different. You're seeing that uh, those of us that work with our minds are getting to be a bigger and bigger percentage of the workforce, and those of us that are working with our hands are getting to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's a big issue, um, a big issue going forward. Let's see. 
uh, this, is what, this is one of the things we're talking about. Why is the Fed raising interest rates? It's because they see inflation coming, and they're not making it up. It's not uh, some, some dream they're having. It's going to mainly be wage inflation. And you can see here, there's an, uh, this is what we see. We see when the unemployment rate drops, uh, earnings go up. I think the big surprise now is that blue line, the slope is going to torque up. We're going to see significant uh, increases in labor labor wages. And I think that's going to really why, what the Fed is trying to stop uh, in here. And it's a big, big deal. You know, I have, a, I, have a, I, I have a radio show I do once a week in New Orleans on NPR called Out to Lunch. And uh, I always ask people, just as an icebreaker, all the, I have business people on. I have entrepreneurs, business people on. And as an icebreaker, I usually will say, what keeps you up at night? And every single one of them talks about having to find labor. There's nothing else they bring up. Uh, it's a really fun show. We've been doing it for eight years. We bring uh, two business people to Commander's Palace, which is arguably one of the best restaurants in the world. And uh, we have the strangest guests. I just love them. I, the stranger they are, the better for me. And um, they have, uh, and everybody says yes because they want the free lunch at Commander's. So it is, uh, um, but I remember I had one guy, and this isn't, this isn't it actually, but I had one guy, and he invented, <laughs> he invented a case for your iPhone. He was from uh, New Orleans. Uh, that weaponizes your iPhone. It turns it into a stun gun. I'm not kidding. I just kidding. If you look up yellowjacketcase.com, you'll see them. And um, it shoots 7 million volts. I'm not kidding. And the best part, and the reason I think about it every day and giggle, is that when you stun somebody, it recharges the phone, which is so great. It's so, oh my God. There's a. <laughs> Oh, leading to such uncomfortable situations as, sorry, Stan, I was low on juice. Let me help you up, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. We, we've had the greatest guests. I had uh, another guest I had, this is about six months ago. It was a husband and wife team that had started five different businesses in New Orleans. Now, the reason we created the show is after Katrina, New Orleans became the number one city in the country for young entrepreneurs. So I wanted to celebrate that. But this couple had started five very different businesses in New Orleans, a, a husband and wife. And I got them on the show, and they were both incredibly nervous. And, you know, the only job of the host, really, is to get people to start talking, you know. So I thought, what am I going to do? I said, all right, you know what I'll do? I'll start out with a real softball question. So I said to the wife, I said, Anne. When did you know Tom was the one? And she said, uh, when the stick turned blue. <laughs> oh my God. And the show is taped, and the general manager always says, that would be a good live show. And I always think, that's because you're not there. That's why you think that. They, um, they, <laughs> oh. Now, the tax cuts have certainly bulked up uh, uh, corporate profits, and, but we think it's really been more of a sugar high than anything else. I think you're going to start to see the benefits of that wear off in 2019. And you can also see we have, if you look at federal deficit divided by GDP, which is how economists look at it, because it's basically it's the size of the deficit divided by the size of the economy. Uh, the same way if you were looking for a bank loan and you were you know, of $10,000 and you were making $10,000 a year, that would be a big deal. But if you were making a million dollars a year and you were getting a $10,000 loan, it wouldn't be a big deal at all. So this is the way we look at it. So basically, before things fell apart, GD the deficit represented a little about 35% of GDP, and then it soared after the economy 08-09 uh, meltdown. And then it was predicted to go up a little bit more all the time going forward, but with the tax cut, it's going to go up in a huge way. In fact, we're already at the stage where the federal deficit is exactly the same size as GDP. So we're going to pay for this. The idea that it was a kind of a free ride is, uh, is very, is, it just isn't true. And this is the two things coming together. And this is the increase in the deficit, but adding on the fact that um, interest rates are going up. So if you look at the interest payments on the debt, it's going through the roof going forward. So there certainly are things to, uh, things to worry about. I, I heard a good story the other day. It was, uh, it was two guys, and they're on death row. And um, nice segue. Where the hell did that come from? The, um, they, um, they, uh, two guys on death row, and the warden comes on Sunday night and says, uh, uh, guys, you're going to be executed tomorrow. And, uh, but we have a policy here where you get one, one wish. And uh, so I just wanted to let you know whatever you think. And the first, first inmate says, well, just before I die, I would like to hear one more time the song, Achy Breaky Heart. 
And uh, he goes, okay, we can do that. And he says, that's the second name, Mary. What would you like? And he says, kill me first. So it's not the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, people ask me if I'm worried about the tea party. I'm not worried about the tea party. I'm worried about the Donner party. Has anybody heard about these guys? They, they, uh, I know they were heading west. They did not have a lot of food. So um, just checking in on them. Um, what's made the stock market go up? Well, the reason it goes up is corporate profits. What makes an individual stock move eventually is corporate profits. What makes the market move is corporate profits. I go all over the country and people go, the stock market, it's a casino. I always think, well, first it's casino. I don't know why we're doing this, but it's not. It's based on corporate profits. I've got a few uh, fictitious millionaires in my presentation. That was Richie Rich, who was kind of a personal hero of mine. They, um, Though after the stock market run of 10 years, I feel kind of rich. You know, I'm now doing something. I'm not really proud of this, but I'm now paying someone to walk around my Fitbit, which is, you know, really, uh, that's, that's extra money, I, I tell you. Um, since World War II, no, he's not. The, um, since World War II, corporate profits are up more than 120-fold, and stock prices have risen more than 180-fold. So what we're getting at here is the key driver to stock prices is corporate profits. The rest of it is noise. The rest of it is meaningless. The rest of it just doesn't count. It's like the, uh, like the first three quarters of an NBA game. It, it just doesn't matter, really. And um, so we will, uh, and this is why the market has done so well. Corporate earnings starting with 2011, as measured by the S&P 500, grew every year. 96, 97, 107, 114, that little drop off you see in 15 and 16 is for two reasons. One is 9% of the index were energy companies and their profits fell 60, 70%. And the other is the dollar was so strong that US companies doing business abroad took a haircut when they converted them back into US dollars. You can see where people are going here. They think uh, 125 last year, $150 in 18, and for 2019, $160. I'm not sure that $160 is going to work out because the Wall Street is projecting a 5% uh, increase in top line and a 10% increase in bottom line earnings. And I think that's, the, uh, that's going to be tough to pull off because corporate profit margins are already at peak levels. And now you're dealing with higher wages and higher interest rates. So I think that is a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable number up there. This is kind of gives you an idea how long this recovery has been, how this economy... Uh, in terms of the stock market, you look at Obama's first term was up 101%. His second term, the market S&P was up 66%. So far, we're up 30% in Trump's term. So if you glue those together, it's a th almost a 350% move in um, in the, in the stock market over the last nine years. That's the best rally in history. Um, uh, what? A, but U.S. corporations are making so much money by the because their earnings aren't good. They're not great. They're phenomenal. But what are they basically doing with the money? Well, U.S. corporations are holding about two trillion on the sidelines and another two and a half trillion abroad. To give you an idea, that's 4.5 trillion. I'm, I want to talk about cash, so I use Johnny Cash. And um, the uh, hello June. And um, they uh, and that's 4.5 billion. For perspective, the GDP of South Korea is 1.5 trillion. So this is enormous. It used to be traditionally the right way to do it. Of course, is when the CEO called the CFO and goes, Bob. The light bill's coming in. You have enough cash? Now it's like, Bob, the, uh, we're thinking of buying two or three small countries. You okay cash-wise? You know, it's, a, it's just amazing. Um, and the other thing is they're using it to buy each other up. In 1995, there were 8,000 public companies, and today there's about 3,600. And here's the important part about that number. It's a net number. It includes all the IPOs that have come since then. So uh, it's been pretty, in fact, one reason you might think the stock market has gone up is supply and demand. It's the first chapter in the economics book. You have more dollars chasing fewer companies. And then when you get down to the share level, U.S. corporations have fallen in love with buying back their own stock. And I sat on the board of a company. We did it. I'm not throwing stones. But it's, uh, they bought back $5 trillion worth of their own stock since the recovery started in 2009. Because we talked about earnings per share being the key driver of stock prices. And they're trying to drive their stock price up. That's, that's their job. And if you take profits divided by shares outstanding, you get earnings per share. Well, if you have extra money, or even if you're borrowing money, and you use it to buy back some shares outstanding, you can have the same profits divided by a smaller denominator and get a higher earnings per share. And that's kind of what's going on if you look at it. The, uh, and by the way, it's so good to work with you folks because you're good at math. You know, sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes you just can't bring this kind of stuff up. You know, it's, uh, you know what they say? They say 
we're only using 20% of our brain. And every time I hear that, I think, damn, what am I doing with the other 70%? You know, so it's, um, it's uh, stand up for yourself. They, um, let's see, they uh, underinvested. One thing Americans tend to be is underinvested abroad. We have the U average US person, uh, investor has 90% of their portfolio in domestic stocks, but U.S. stocks represent less than half of the world market. So most people should be more diversified. But, you know, the U.S. Is, was very slow. We've always been very parochial. We're one big country, you know. We're not like Europe where everybody's next to each other. And I remember in about 50 years ago, the uh, General Motors uh, made the, this is give an example of how we weren't really good at this stuff. They made the, the Chevy Nova, if you can remember that car, and they shipped it to Mexico. And after about a month, they looked and no one had bought the car. So they had a big meeting in Detroit. They said, what is it? You think it's color? You think it's size? You think it's shape? And one guy raises his hand and goes, well, uh, you know, in Spanish, Nova means it won't go. So it's like, all right, all right, Paul. Yeah, good job. So um, the, uh, this, this I saw the other day in the onion. CIA realizes it's been using black highlighters all these years. They, um, that must have been a very difficult <laughs> thing to learn about. Where, um, I know I saw some bankers in the crowd, you know, bank, I've personally been investing in financial services companies, banks, insurance companies, mutual funds. I think I've got a great, as the demographics really start to come together and people get older into retirement years, I think it's going to be a big deal. And the banks, the banks, they've, I mean, you, you seem very smart, but you are the same people that gave us the, the Braille keypads on the drive up ATM. So, you know, just, I just want to throw that out, you know, it's a, go ahead, deposit, Martha. So it's, um, let's, um. The other thing you hear all the time now is what, um, what happens if the scandals in Washington get worse and you get a resignation or an impeachment or something. And they always point to Watergate, that period between February 73 and August 74. And the S&P did fall almost 30%. But that, that's an easy answer, but it's not the right answer because that's the same exact time when we had the first Arab oil embargo, which led to much higher interest rates, higher inflation, stagflation. So it's difficult to say how much of that was the OPEC move and how much of it was the problems in Washington. Um, this is true. If you, if you have a rental car, this has always been very helpful. You know, when you get a rental car and you uh, go to get next to the airport, you realize very quickly that Hertz charges you like $15 a gallon to fill the car up, you know, which is, which, which is why they call it Hertz. And, um, and, um, and so you go to a gas station, and you never know what side to put the fuel on. This is like, and it's immediate panic, because it's not your car. But if you look on the gas gauge, there's always a gas pump and a little arrow that tells you where to put the gas. So, you know, I just want to say, like, years from now, you'll think, what did the Italian man say again, you know? And um, people always say, say something in Italian. The body's in the trunk, you know? And um, <laughs> my father would kill me if he heard me doing these. They, uh, they, uh, <laughs> You know what Italians don't like about Jehovah's Witnesses, right? We don't like any witnesses. You know, so it's, um, <laughs> they, um, just a thought, just a thought. They, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, where the stock market is, you know, obviously got some issues uh, going forward. It's the bond market I worry about more than anything else. And I run into people all the time and they'll say, oh, my husband and I, we don't we'd invest in stocks. They're too scary. Uh, we've got all our money in long-term bonds. You know, what they don't remember, because interest rates have gone down for 34 straight years. I've been in this business 40 years. They've dropped for so long that people forgot that when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. These are the same people who are going to call their brokers in about six months and go, excuse me, what are these parentheses in my account? You know, and uh, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, they, uh, let's see. Uh, I teach, uh, this generation I'm teaching at Tulane is terrific. And, you know, I know it's, it's very common for baby boomers to say, yeah, they're nothing, they're not like us. They, uh, they're living in their parents' basement, saving up for a new tattoo. You know, they're, they're, they're slackers. They're not. They're the best generation I've ever seen. They are smarter than we were. They work hard. They are more community-oriented. It is just awesome. You know, Tulane, after Katrina mandated, we still do, community service. We're the only university that mandates community service. And students love it. This generation loves the idea of giving back. You know, we've had, since we did that, we now have an average of 39,000 applications for 1,700 freshman slots. So this is what these kids want to do. I think we've done a lot, of, a lot of things well, but that's really been part of it. And you might not notice this, unless I said it, but if you go to a college campus now, it is decidedly female. 
Uh, Tulane is 60-40. I have friends of schools that are 70-30, 75-25. Um, and women are better educated than men. And, and, and one-third of marriages, and this is going to go up, they're going to earn more money. Uh, this generation, by the way, is more mobile, more urban. I was walking through, uh, what is it, Automotive Alley in Midtown today, where the young people want to live. They want to live downtown, uh, and they're starting their families later. Uh, their idea of pure hell is to live in a cul-de-sac and commute to an office park. You know, it's it. It's a very different group of people. They want to walk to their work, walk to the bar, walk to the dry cleaning. Um, this, I think, is the funniest graph. I mean, it's very, very important. But marrying up, you always think of that term as you marrying somebody that has more money or their family has more money than your family. But this is marrying up educationally. And just recently, now you can say that the average family, the wife is more educated than the husband. This is kind of amazing. Look at the gap that has been filled. So, I mean, for women, just amazing kudos. Guys, I, I really don't know what the hell happened to us, but it's, um, they, um, just, <laughs> I think it's, uh, oh, man. And this economy is consumer driven. That's how the U.S. economy works. It's the way it's always been, the way it's always gonna be. Uh, and basically, if you look at that, it's, uh, when you look at that consumer, and this sounds a little curt, but it's true, is the most important part of that is the middle class consumer. That's what really determines if it's gonna be a strong economy or weak economy. It sounds bad, but the rich already own everything and the poor can't afford anything. So it's that middle class economy you have to keep economically vibrant. Like you remember, um, it's spending that makes the economy go. You might remember after 9-11, uh, President Bush came out and said that everybody needs to go shopping. And uh, of course, you know, I'm like under my desk. Yeah, I'll be right with you. See you at the food court, you know. And, um, they, uh, and he got a lot of flack for that, but he was right. He was right. That's why, how the economy works in this country. It's what makes this, the country strong, you know. So it's, uh, now I do miss him because he always had very interesting take on the English language. I, I do miss those. They, uh, it's uh, like the time, remember, France decided not to help us in Iraq, but six months later, really, really got back at him because he said uh, he saw the president of France at one of those economic uh, events, and he goes, uh, you know why you don't have much of an economy is uh, <laughs> you don't even have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a French word, but it's, um, there's, um, I'm not sure that really happened, but that very, um, let's see. So the middle class consumer is the job creator, not the super wealthy, but the middle class consumer. Over the next 30 years, the population of working age people will slowly and steadily increase in the US. Now most of this comes from immigration. We're not doing a particularly good job of making babies. Um, and if you wanted the economy to grow faster, you'd need more working age people. This is, if you asked an economist, the key metric going forward for a region, that's what they would give you. And it'll be, this working age people will be declining in most industrial parts of the world, including Europe, Japan, and China. So we're doing better than others, but we could be going uh, a little bit, uh, little bit faster. It is funny when you teach economics and finance and you get your kids, you know, I always try to teach them things when they were little. Like early on, I started, um, I started teaching them about taxes by eating 38% of their ice cream. It was, it's really, really worked out, I think. Good lesson. Um, let's see. Immigration stat, uh, you don't hear this, but this is the truth. 40% of the Fortune 500 were started by immigrants or their children. If you look at Intel as a science talent search every year, and only 17% of the applicants had parents born in the US. We are losing a lot of brain trust by, by curtailing uh, immigration. It's a very, very big deal. It's hurting us in medical research, uh, Silicon Valley, the financial industry. It's a very, very big, uh, big deal. The, um, you know, you can tell, you know, if you, for the professors that are out here, a lot of times the smartest kid in your class is the foreign student. You know, it's not hard to think of, though, because my foreign students are going home at night and developing trading algorithms in their apartment, and my U.S. kids are in the French Quarter doing jello shots. So it's, you know, it's somewhat predictable. But um, let's see, the uh, Mythbuster, why don't people do better with their money? And this is really a very important question. It's mainly because there's things we hold as gospel that just aren't right. That's the big problem with that. Like, for instance, you hear people say, avoid investing in stocks when the economy's slumping and unemployment's high. Well, that makes sense, unless you think about it. That's the problem there. They, <laughs> that's the time you should be investing. And, uh, and it's because basically, when unemployment's high, the government's number one job is getting people back to work. So they lower rates, they hold them down, and they stimulate spending. Exactly what corporate America wants, exactly what Wall Street wants. So it's, um, it's counterintuitive. Since 1948, stock market returns have been better than three times as high when unemployment rates have topped 6.6%. 
And those, of course, the times everybody at the party is telling you, put your money in canned goods. We'll be eating our young. You know, and, um, and so it's very lonely. We're at 3.7% now, so we're certainly out of that happy window. Um, some random thoughts on the economy. Tax evasion has added about $3 trillion to the national debt over the past decade. I don't know if you're like me, but I watch television late at night and those ads come on, and it's always some guy going, yep, that's right. I owed Uncle Sam a half a million dollars, but thanks to Ned, I paid $4, you know. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, you're the problem. <laughs> you know, it's, um, jeez, everybody's going, it's open carry. Maybe he is armed. I don't know. They, um, they, uh. As a percentage of GDP, federal taxes are now low, at their lowest level since 1950, and that's even before the tax cut. And finally, um, you know, you could be for Obamacare or against Obamacare. It actually doesn't make any difference. It's just one in eight workers is of normal weight without a chronic health problem. And that's really the issue. We're not in particularly great uh, condition. We don't take very good care of ourselves. And this came from the Wall Street Journal. So, uh, Oh, I put this in for me. I thought this was funny. Area man, proud he can still fit in the car from high school. So it's, um, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> let's see. Seems happy. There's, um, let's see. When we look at GDP, we, we can see what happened. We basically fell out of bed in, in 08, 09, and then we've been positive ever since. Uh, you can see that, and that's really, so one of the things you heard was we were going to have a U-shape recovery, which meant that maybe it would go down lower and come back. Uh, but it wasn't. It was a V-shaped recovery. It came back very, very, very quickly, and that was the big surprise. And keep in mind, the stock market started rallying about four months before the recession ended. The stock market is a leading economic indicator. So one of the problems you're going to have as an investor, is you, a lot of people say, well, when the recession starts, I'm getting out of stocks. It'll be too late. That's the problem. If you look at this business cycles, I mentioned that democracy and capitalism, the only systems that work, but capitalism is cyclical. It's the way it is. It has to wash itself out every seven to 10 years or so. So in an early cycle, which we would think of as 08, 09, you get fiscal and monetary stimulus, the Fed lowers rates, and economic growth starts to increase. In the mid-cycle, profit margins start to peak and management begins to increase their share repurchases to boost profits. We are in the late cycle, where fiscal and monetary restrictions, the Fed's raising rates because they see the unemployment, the, the inflation rearing up, Employers have trouble finding available workers and wages increase. Now, we're in the late cycle. It's hard to say if we've got two months left or two years left. That's the big problem. You don't know how long it's going to be or, or what the, uh, the width is going to be. But then eventually you go into a recession, economic contraction, falling manufacturer and retail activity, earnings and credit lending drop quickly. So that's what we see. This, I think, is such a breakthrough, and I wanted to share this with everyone. I think interest rates are actually a direct reflection of the height of the Federal Reserve Chairman. And um, <laughs> this is so important. And um, like, you know, Velker was a big guy. He was like 6'3 or something. And rates were very high. And then Greenspan was smaller. And then Bernanke was even smaller. Rates dropped. Janet Yellen was quite tiny. And now Powell is uh, right about six feet and rates keep going up. So just wanted to say, so next time, maybe hire a little person. That's what I would think is, um, let's see. Now, the four most dangerous words in, in finance are this time it's different. Everybody says, oh, no, not this recovery. This will last forever, you know. It's never true. Now, the, those are the four most dangerous words in finance. The seven most dangerous words overall are, hey, we're getting the band back together. But that's a, that's a whole, different, whole different problem. Um, Got this from The Onion. New financial report finds economy invincible forever this time. This is exactly what people are saying, and this isn't right. So we have to look forward and see where to go. That last recession, by the way, if that was the only recession you've ever seen, was totally atypical. It was much more like a depression. Since World War II, an average recession has lasted about 11 months, significantly smaller contraction in GDP and fewer layoffs. So the name recession kind of scares a lot of people, but it really, uh, really shouldn't. So um, let's see. Uh, this is to tell you how expensive the market looks. This is what's called the Schiller PE. And instead of looking at priced earnings the way we usually look for the last year, it takes an average inflation adjusted for that company's or the market's earnings over the last 10 years. And you can see we're at about 33 times earnings. The only times we've been higher than that is the year 2000 and just before the crash in 1929. 
So it is a very, very, very expensive market. I, I remember in 2000, I was giving a speech in South Carolina, and just before I went on, I was in the green room, and it was for a financial company, and the, the president came out to see me, and he says, Peter, I know how you feel about the market's valuation at this level, but uh, you know, if you could just say something positive, and I remember saying, uh, would you accept two negatives? And, uh, and uh, that, that's kind of what, what happened. Um, now, one of the problems here is that the majority of Americans are always wrong. In fact, I always remember when I first started this in the investment business at age 22, an older guy came aside to me and he, he was like, well, he's older. I thought he was like 26, but I thought he was older. And, uh, and he said to me, Peter, remember, if a majority of the people were right, a majority of the people would be rich and they're not. And I've always remembered that. In fact, I have that tattooed on my left buttocks. It's a very important thing not to forget. And it's true, in the early 1990s, two-thirds of Americans felt the country was on the wrong track, and the 90s was a great time to invest. In 2000, 80% of Americans believed the country was on the right track, and we went into the lost decade. In 2010, nearly everyone thought the country was on the wrong track, and the market has gone straight up since then, and now people are very upbeat. So that kind of gives you where the, where the story goes. I know you've got a lot of casinos in here, and I just want to tell you, I don't know, you've probably all thought about this, but you maybe haven't done it, but every casino ad on the bottom right-hand corner has gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700, and this has bothered me for years. We have casinos in Louisiana. So the other day, about six months ago, I'm driving from New Orleans to Baton Rouge on I-10, and I, uh, and I see one of these billboards, and I pull the car off to the side of the road in front of the billboard, and I call on my cell phone, and it, it was amazing experience. I, I dial the number and they say, gambling problem. And I said, listen, I'm holding a 10. I know the deal is showing a jack. And um, <laughs> they are wonderful people, wonderful people. They, um, <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, I wanted some reason to bring in Eric Clapton in here. So um, uh, research has shown that investors who traded the least outperform those who traded the most by almost seven percentage points annually. You know, I've known hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in 40 years that have made millions of dollars in the markets, and they've almost all made it the same way. They bought good stocks or good mutual funds at attractive prices and held on. You know, TV has you thinking like fast money, like it's not investing. I don't know what that is. Uh, most investors should probably stay invested and maybe keep some cash available for inevitable opportunities. A lot of people have turned to indexing. I think that's a great way. It's a very inexpensive way to invest, index funds. But I think everybody's going into the S&P 500 index, and those are the 500 most expensive stocks in America. So I think you'd be better off in a smaller, mid-cap, kind of small-cap index fund that do exist. Which inning are we in? Well, I think we're already, in terms of this economic recovery, we're already in extra innings. The last three economic recoveries lasted an average of 90 months each, and this current recovery is the second longest on record. It's been... Let's see, it's been, uh, let's see, 90, 90 months under President Obama and, let's see, 20 months under President Trump. So 100, 110 months long. The, the longest was 120 months. Uh, so we're really at the tail end uh, of, the re of the recovery. This I thought was great. This comes from the Brookings Institute. If you only remembered one thing after this, it would be wonderful, is that um, this is looking at happiness and age, and they're trying to figure out at what age are you happiest? which I thought was so great. Like it, on the far left, like when you're 18, you're pretty happy. You've got like a, a boyfriend and a driver's license. Things are going okay, you know? And, um, and then, then you come down, then you start to work and you're the low person on the totem pole and you make less than everyone else and you work more hours and, uh, and that's really rough. And then after that, you've got teenagers in the house. That's terrific. And, um, they, uh, <laughs> and then... And then you're taking care of aging parents, which is an important part of your life, but a real challenge. But when you get to be my age, around 61, it gets much better. So I only have one message today for the whole, everyone is, don't die. It's really, it's going to get better. And, uh, and when you do retire, stay active, maybe work for a nonprofit or something. Feel, feel like you're active and needed. Um, I go around the country and everybody seems so nostalgic about the way things used to be. The truth is, it's better now than it's ever been. I, get, I go to places and people come up to me and go, yeah, we made our own soap. Yeah, terrific, thanks. There's a, they, um, things are getting better for most of us. The babies born in America today are the luckiest crop in history, Warren Buffett said. And I just like the visual on a crop of babies, you know, just like looking at, or they're knee high, you know. And um, they, uh, 
And Warren Buffett, I love Warren Buffett. I love Jimmy Buffett. It's an amazing family, very talented family. And um, oh, that Thanksgiving in Omaha, whoo, I'll never forget. And um, they, uh, the average American today enjoys better access to transportation, entertainment, communications, and medical services than the robber barons did in the 1930s. So that's what you have to remember. And sometimes I'll run into somebody and they'll just be adamant about it. They're like, it's not, it was better back then. It was better back then. And I always have one word for them, dentistry. <laughs> ah, ah, take it off, take it off. So um, let's see. They, uh, and when I get confronted with people that don't believe that democracy and capitalism are the best systems and that, eventually, that it works out over the long run, um, these are usually at bars in New Orleans. It's a house of cards. And um, they, uh, but I always tell them this quote from Tim Dye, as long as people have babies, capital depreciates, technology evolves, and tastes and preferences change, there's a powerful underlying impetus for growth that is almost certain to reveal itself in any reasonably well-managed economy. And that's what it is. The people that want to sell the U.S. short is crazy. I mean, we're going to have bumps along the road and such, but this is real. Anybody that's shorted and bet against the United States since 1776 has lost. So it might be a good thing to good thing to remember. These are the books we use on campus. A um, couple of we use these uh, on my uh, in my class, my uh, Birkin Road Reports class that I'll talk to you about in just a second. Um, One up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. If you had a young person that wanted to know how the markets work, I would use that book. It's a uh, layman's language. Uh, you can read it under a tree in a day. Peter Lynch was the great money manager at the Fidelity Magellan Fund. And he's got great stories in there, like how he found some of the great stocks. Like he was visiting with Holiday Inn's management, and he asked them, who's your toughest competitor in lodging? And they said, damn, there's this company in Texas called La Quinta, and they are kicking our butt. So he didn't buy stock in Holiday Inn, he bought stock in La Quinta. And, <laughs> and it went up 20-fold, you know? So it's, um, and a lot of people don't know it, but La Quinta in Spanish, actually means next to Denny's. A lot of people, a lot of people don't know that, but it's, um, they, um, let's see, they, uh, this is the book, um, oh, I had something I was going to show you here. I knew I had this up for a reason. You know, I'm staying at the hotel, and they, they give you the USA Today. I only read it when I'm in a hotel. It's like McNews, you know, and, um, but I was going to, I knew I brought this for a reason. I looked at um, the back. You know, if you ever read USA Today, there's one story for each state in the back. You've probably all seen this. And I always look up um, Louisiana, you know, to see what their news is. And then I always look at where I'm traveling. So I looked up Oklahoma today. And this was the most important story that USA Today found. I don't know how they determined this. But this is, um, and I don't know where this is, but Enid? Where is that from? Uh, oh, North, okay. It's Enid, Oklahoma. Last night, thieves broke into a pharmaceutical warehouse and stole two pallets of Viagra. <laughs> That's your biggest problem in Oklahoma. I don't, oh my God, the, uh, jeez. Uh, says here, Enid police are looking for hardened criminals. There's, um, <laughs> very nice, very nice. There's, um, <laughs> Well, he won't be speaking at our church. I think we've had it. The, um, the, uh, <laughs> I think when you're from New Orleans, you get away with things. But I put these on your table, and I just wanted to spend a minute telling you about it. I only have a few minutes with you. but Because uh, right now you're thinking, where did they find this guy? And for heaven's sake, why did they let him work with children? And um, so uh, in 1993, I started a program called Birkin Road Reports. It's the only program like this at any university in the country. I take 200 students, I break them up into teams of five, and each team is assigned to one of 40 small cap publicly traded companies in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And, uh, uh, and so they, what they, and these are little companies that we call stocks under rocks that mainly Wall Street really hasn't heard of. And the students produce these investment research reports. They're all free at www.birkenroad.org. It's just a university program. And, um, and they actually, we actually fly out to spend the day with the CEO and CFOs of these companies. And uh, we have a great, great time with it. We have the best, uh, we have the best site visits in the free world. We've taken helicopters to offshore oil rigs. We've gone to steel mills. We've gone to chicken processing plants. If you've never been to a chicken processing plant, do take the family. That is a nice outing. And, um, and I take a lot of abuse for that one. But really, after a couple of years of therapy, these kids are fine. And that's what's, that's what's really important. And chickens always seem so herky-jerky and paranoid. But, you know, they have a 100% murder rate. So, you know, it's kind of well-warranted. The... Um, 
Uh, we've sent 750 students from this program in our 25 years to jobs in the investment business. Been a great springboard. At the very bottom of the first page, you can see we have an annual conference where the companies we follow send their CEOs and CFOs to present. It's the first weekend of Jazz Fest. We call it Jazz Fest for Capitalists. And uh, if you'd like to come, it's, we'd love to have you, uh, have you in town. It's free and open to the public. If you turn to page two, you can see there's uh, my students and I going to... Uh, uh, we're in Midland, Texas, uh, in a shale field, looking at the, di the different sands and propens. On the bottom of uh, page three, there's a group of students getting ready to take a helicopter offshore. If you go to page four, um, that's a funny thing. We've been doing this for 25 years, but 17 years ago, one of the local banks, Hancock, asked if they could use the students' research and create a mutual fund of these stocks under rocks. And they did, and the fund trades publicly under HHBUX. It's got about $600 million in it. And in those 17 years, it's outperformed 99.4% of the nation's stock mutual funds, which is really disturbing, really, because I have the lowest payroll on Wall Street, zero. You know, it's like, uh, like moon pies and a Dr. Pepper. We're out of here, you know. And, um, they, um, and then if you open it up to the middle, like I said, I only got a minute with you here, but if you open up to the middle, these are the little companies we follow. And the reports are about 30 pages in length. They're all at the website. And, uh, and they're all interesting stories, like... Uh, uh, Calmaine Foods is the uh, largest distributor of eggs in the United States. They're out of Jackson, Mississippi. That was the first report we ever wrote 25 years ago. And I remember we sent the report to the CEO, Fred Adams, and he uh, called me up and he said, Peter, that's, the students did a great job. That's the best report ever written about Calmaine. And I just wanted you to tell the students off. Uh, and I said, sir, thank you very much. It makes me very proud. And he says, now there was one mistake. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'll get that fixed. What was it? And he goes, well, you referred to us as egg producers. We're egg distributors. The hens are egg producers. So they, um, <laughs> little city boy problem. But, um, and you'll see a lot of names in that, in that list. But I, finally, I just wanted to uh, thank you for having me. I've met so many nice people. And, uh, and Roy was the greatest. He told me that the salad dressing was under the salad. That was so great. And um, they, uh, but the best academic experience I ever had was almost 10 years ago to the day, and that was I brought 27 students to Omaha, Nebraska to spend the day with Warren Buffett. And we were there eight days after they closed Lehman Brothers. It was the end of the world. And, um, and I thought they was going to cancel because of that. It would have been planned for months, but he said, let's go with it. And I meet, meet a lot of famous people when you do public speaking. But some are nice and some aren't the way you think it would be. But Buffett blew me away. He was so kind and so warm and so generous with his time. He took us out to lunch and made us drink cherry Cokes, you know. It was, uh, it was so great. And the first question one of the Tulane students asked him, and this was a terrible time in the markets, they asked him, he said, Mr. Buffett, how bad is it on Wall Street right now? And Buffett said, I, it's terrible. I've never heard such sad stories. I heard a story last week where an investment banker left his big office in Manhattan, went to his big home in Long Island, met his wife at the doorstep and said, honey, we got to talk because uh, I'm not going to get a bonus this year and I don't, I don't think I'm going to get a bonus next year and, and we're going to have to make some changes around here and frankly, I don't even know how to bring this up, but, but darling, you're going to have to learn to cook so we can get rid of the chef. And she says, well, okay, but you're going to have to learn to make love so we can get rid of the gardener. So it's, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>
The economic trends discussed today will undoubtedly influence how we move ahead. Once again, we would like to thank our today's signature sponsor, Arvest Bank, and all of our other sponsors that helped make this event possible. Thank you so much for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>